here. Last Sunday, I shared with you a new thing to us. It's not necessarily a new thing to me, but it's going to be a tradition for us that between the close of service today and the start of service next week, I want for us to get out of here and go out and bring the light of Christ to our world. That is bringing to fruition when we pray, God, thy kingdom come. We get to participate in bringing the kingdom of God to where you live, where you work, where you go to school. We get to bring God's kingdom to come. And when you do that, when you talk to people about Jesus, when you pray with someone, when you invite somebody to come to church with you, when you give them a Bible or a gospel or something like that, when you do the spiritual work of going out and sharing God's love with somebody, get in touch with me, text me, call me, email me, get in touch with me and say, Rich, light that candle, okay? And this is my very special candle. And I said last week, nobody lights my candle except me. And then I, com I, I completely broke that rule this morning. And there's a story behind it. So this week, I started getting messages. On Sunday, started getting messages. The very first message I got was middle of the afternoon, last Sunday afternoon. Uh, 10-year-old kid, Miles Thorne. 10-year-old Miles calls me, interrupting my pregame. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm getting ready for the Super Bowl. Miles calls me and he says, I bought somebody tacos. Does that count? <laughs> and I said, well, tell me the story. So Miles' birthday had happened and he had gotten a gift card at Taco Bell because he likes Taco Bell. And so they went to Taco Bell to get tacos, and as they were driving through, Miles sees a homeless person. And Miles thinks, I'm hungry for tacos. I'll bet you they're hungry for tacos. He looks at Jason and says, can I buy tacos for that man? By the way, Matthew 25, anyone, anyone? Bueller, Bueller, okay? I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison or in the hospital and you came and visited me. Miles was the first one last Sunday afternoon to get in touch with me. He went out from here and touched our community for the kingdom. He brought the kingdom from heaven to earth. He was the first one. So this morning, I'm not sure he was nearly as impressed with it as I was, but I had him light the candle this morning. Because it was the very first, yeah, the very first one. And then throughout the day, throughout the day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, throughout this week, I got text messages and I got emails, people telling me, hey, I, I, I knew I needed to have a conversation with somebody, and I did. I, I prayed with somebody at the store. I had, was talking to an old friend, and they were sharing with me about their burdens, and I said, can I pray with you? So we are doing that. But now I want us to be organized and intentional about doing that. And when you do that, I want you to tell me, because you celebrate what you want more of. And so we celebrate as a church when, when the church gets out of here and goes and brings the kingdom to Clarksville. We celebrate when we go from here and we love the Lord our God. We love God by loving others. Today's the fifth week of five weeks. We're closing up this, uh, this series. I've been talking about evangelism. Evangelism is simply telling other people about Jesus. So the very first week we were in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, and it said, let your light shine. Remember that? And I got to eat donuts that morning. Live your life in such a way that people who are watching you would want what you have which really should make us ask the question, am I living my life in such a way that people watching me would want what I have? So if you are not shining out in the world, how in the world is someone gonna see the light of Jesus through you? Matthew chapter five gives us intentional go and shine 
so the world around you will see the light of Jesus. Second week, we looked at what Paul said to Timothy. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, what you've heard me teach you, put into the hands of other people who can pass it along. There were kind of four generations there. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to reliable people who can then equip others. We are down that line, several more steps, but somebody put the gospel into your hands, we are to then pass it along to others. Two weeks ago, we looked at Matthew chapter 22. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I think those two are, are completely intertwined. We show God that we love him by loving others. Otherwise, we're just flapping our gums. What we do in here on Sunday mornings, when we come together, what we do in here matters nothing to the world out there, period. What we do in here matters nothing to the world out there unless we take it out with us. We show God our love for him by how we love others. And then last week we looked at Paul's letter to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5 where he said, where he gives us marching orders. We are reconcilers, we are ambassadors. We are bridging the gap between people who need to know Jesus and, and, and introducing them to Jesus. We are going out representing the kingdom and sharing the gospel with people. This morning we're in John chapter 4. I've got a big old long chunk to read, but I'm not going to make you stand for all of it. Would you stand up with me? John chapter 4. There's one last thing I want to make sure we are all clear on before we close up this package of sermons on evangelism. And we see it here in John chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. Forget it. Starting in verse 3. So, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. John has already gotten it wrong. Now, John was there. I wasn't there. But I know Jesus did not have to go through Samaria. We'll talk about that in a second. But John says, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. All Genesis stuff there. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came by to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Now, I'm going to keep reading in this, in this uh, passage, but I want you to keep in mind, there are so many things Jesus does wrong here. Now, he does them wrong for a reason, but he did not follow protocol. He wasn't being a good religious person. So many things that Jesus does wrong here. Keep reading in verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst Indeed, the water I give them will become in them like a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, see, the woman is thinking very two-dimensionally, okay? She's thinking thirsty water well. She's playing checkers. Jesus is playing chess. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep on coming out here in the middle of the day when it's hot and drawing water. Jesus said, go, call your husband and come back. So he takes that conversation to a whole new personal level. 
I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Skip on ahead to verse 25. Verse 25, the woman says this, I know that Messiah, the Christ, I know that Messiah will come, that he's coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus here doesn't say it, but I believe Jesus leans in and lowers his voice and says, I, the one who am speaking to you, I'm the Messiah. Now here, I know we're just in John chapter 4, but this is the first place in John that he reveals who he is, and he chooses this woman to do that. That's, that's, that's incredible to me. Verse 27, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman. They were shocked, shocked that he was talking to this woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or what are you, why are you talking to her? Then, leaving her water jar, this is the key where we are this morning, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, we'll talk about that in a minute, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Now, backtrack again to verse 26. Didn't he just say, I'm the Messiah? She goes into town, could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. They came to check out this woman's claims. Go to to verse 39. Some of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And what was the woman's testimony? One statement and one question. He told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? Come meet a man. Come meet a man. That was her entire testimony. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged Jesus to stay with them, and he stayed two more days. Because of his words, many more became believers. Verse 42. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've believed for ourselves. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man is the Savior of the world. Now, every once in a while, when you, when you read something in Scripture, you just start to put, you know, piece things together. Jesus does so many things wrong here. Um, there's a map. In the first service, we ended up with a map. Uh, do you have it, Lou? So, if, uh, if, Jesus was in, uh, if, if Jesus was up in Galilee, and he's walking to Jerusalem... He would walk south right through Samaria. Do you see that on the the map? Now, everybody, you know, nobody Ubered back then. Very few people had donkeys and camels and such and such. So you would walk from place to place. A self-respecting Jew, especially a rabbi, especially a teacher of the law, especially a Pharisee or a Sadducee, the more Jewish and important you were, the less likely you would have walked a straight line. Do you know why? Because every first grader knows that cooties transfer. (laughs) Everybody knows it. So if you've got the cooties and somebody touches you, they now have the cooties. And the Jewish people believed that the Samaritans had the cooties. So if you were up in Nazareth or Capernaum or Cana and you needed to get to Jericho or Jerusalem, you would walk out of your way. What could be a one or two day walk could be a three or four or five day walk. You'd go way out of the way so your feet would not trample on Samaritan cootie written soil. So let's just say for a second that we've got to walk to Chattanooga. That's a long walk, by the way. Okay, the straight shot would be we walk out to 24 and we stay on 24 till we get to Chattanooga. Not if Nashville was Samaria. We'd walk way out of the way so we wouldn't touch Nashville cooties. 
Okay, so we'd walk the state line, we'd go east along the Kentucky line, we'd go over to Franklin, Kentucky, and then down into Portland and, and White House and Goodlettsville, and we'd go around, we'd stay way east, we'd go out toward the airport, get down south to Brentwood, and then we'd go, not to Brentwood, but down toward uh, Murfreesboro, and then we'd go on to Chattanooga because we don't want our feet to touch Samaria, sorry, Nashville. John says here in John chapter 4, verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. But he did anyway. You know why? You know why? You know why? You know why? Because Jesus showed his holiness and his goodness and his love by the people he did touch. Not by the people he didn't touch. He showed his goodness and holiness by the places he did go not the places he didn't go. We, we holy churchy people often get in the habit of showing how good and holy and righteous we are by the people we don't interact with, by the places we don't go, by the things we don't do. Rather, following Jesus' example, when he went to people. We believe in a doctrine that I, I shared with you last week called prevenient grace. We don't have to wait on people to come running to Jesus. Jesus is running to them. Jesus came to this woman. This woman doesn't go out to draw water in the middle of the day on a hot desert day. She doesn't go out at noon to meet Jesus. She went out to get water. Jesus was there. He had come to her. Jesus shouldn't have been in Samaria. He shouldn't have been talking to a woman. Religious leaders didn't talk to women, they talked to men. Religious leaders didn't talk to Samaritan woman, women, especially. Religious leaders didn't talk to uh, women of questionable personality, reputation, character. Now, we know a couple of things about this woman. First of all, she's out in the middle of the day drawing water. If you were a woman in this culture in this time, you would go out early in the morning when it was cool, late in the evening when it was cool. You don't go at noon when it's hot and sunny. So she was out there at noon when it was hot and sunny. All the other women in town had probably gone out earlier in the morning. She went out alone, which we kind of start connecting dots. Why would she have done that? Well, I'm just going to infer here that she doesn't have a very good reputation with the other women. She felt like a bit of an outcast. Jesus calls her out here in a minute on, on the fact that she's had five husbands and the woman that she's with now is not her husband. So it could be that she had questionable character. It could also be, and this is just something that I came across this week, it could be that it's not so much that she had questionable character. There's a theory also, she may have been barren. She may have not been able to have children, so she had a husband who took her to be his wife and tried to have children, and when he realized she couldn't have children, he cast her off. And someone else took her to be his wife, and when they realized she couldn't have children, he cast her off. And again, and again, and again, it could be that she, it wasn't that she had questionable character, it could be that she didn't have loose morals, it might have been that she was a victim, that she was property in a sense. And that would have come along with its own shame and pain and hurt. And again, Jesus goes to her. I love that. Jesus shouldn't have been in Samaria. He shouldn't have been talking to a Samaritan. Everybody knows that cooties transfer, so if Jesus asks her for a gift, asks her for water, if the Samaritan woman has lowered a Samaritan bucket into a Samaritan well to fetch up Samaritan water every way along the line, everything is contaminated. Jesus shouldn't have touched any of it. And yet Jesus goes to her, asks for water. He accepted this gift. And he said, she says, she says, I, I don't know a lot of things. I don't know a lot of things, but I know that someday the Messiah is going to come. And Jesus leans in and says, the one who's talking to you right now, I'm the Messiah. 
and I've come to you. So the disciples come out, catch Jesus talking to this woman that he really wasn't talking, he was supposed to be talking to. And, and the lady splits. She puts her jar down and she takes off back into town. And this is what I want us to take away with us this morning. Verse 28, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Now, here's my question. Who did she go to? She went back into town and told the people. Who'd she go to? Did she go to the town council? Did she run to the newspaper? Okay. She didn't go to the, to the leading elders. She didn't go to the synagogue. She went to her people. Whoever her people was, that's who she went to. So other people, perhaps, that were in her situation, her neighbors, her family, anybody that she had any kind of influence on, the Greek, the, the Greek New Testament word from the book of Acts is called oikos. We all have an oikos. It's not just yogurt. It's our household. It's our people. It's our clan. So I have a household in my house, me and Dana and Grant. That's our household. And then I have a neighborhood household, Earl, across the street, and uh, Becky next door. I have a work oikos. I have a school oikos. I have a Starbucks oikos. I have the places I go, the interactions that I have with people. That's my clan. She went to her clan and said two sentences. One was an invitation and one was a question. She knew nothing. She knew nothing. She goes and said, come and meet a guy that I just met who told me stuff. Now, I got to tell you, I've heard a lot of testimonies in my life. That's a pretty lousy one. (laughs) Come meet a guy. You got to come meet this guy. And then she asked, could he be the Messiah? Didn't Jesus just say I, the one who is speaking to you, I am he. I'm the Messiah. She immediately forgets, goes back into town. Come meet this guy. Could he be the Messiah? We think sometimes that when we share Jesus with people, we think sometimes when we tell other people about the good news that we have in Christ, we think sometimes when we try and communicate things that we've learned in God's word, or things that we've learned here in church, that we have to know a bunch of stuff. You don't have to know a bunch of stuff. That's good news. You don't have to have a bunch of scripture memorized. It's awesome if you do. You don't have to have a prepackaged spiel where you've memorized a bunch of things and now you're sharing. You don't have to have something in your pocket. Oh, man, it's time to talk to Big Joe about Jesus. I got to take out my cheat sheet. and Step one, Joe. Okay, that's not it. We could simply arrange a meeting. She went back into town and said, come meet this guy. Come meet a man who told me things that he shouldn't have known. He says he's the Messiah. I don't know. Could he be the Messiah? Folks, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about evangelism. We've been talking about taking what we know, what we're learning, the things that we experience in here, out into the world. When we do that, like Miles did last Sunday afternoon, we bring God's kingdom to come. When we stop in an office, at school, at Target, when we stop and we pray with people, we bring God's kingdom. When you use your birthday gift card at Taco Bell to buy a homeless person tacos, you bring God's kingdom to come. And we need to celebrate those things. And the last thing I want to encourage you to do here is this. We don't all speak 
flowery words. We don't all have great wells of biblical understanding and knowledge. We, many of us, don't feel adequate for going out and sharing with others the little often that we know. But at the least, all of us can be inviters. Come meet this Jesus that I've met. Could he be the Messiah? Folks, the convincing there, that's up to Jesus. Jesus is the one that does the convincing. One of, one of, the, one of the highlights of all of my years in ministry, let me tell you a quick story. One of the highlights of all my years in ministry uh, is one of my good buddies in, in Sumner County named, uh, named Mickey. Mickey had Jackson on his basketball team. And Mickey, Mickey saw in Jackson at, at like six, seven, eight years old, Mickey saw in Jackson a good little athlete, and so he wanted Jackson to be on his baseball team. And the only way to make sure that Jackson was going to be on his baseball team was to make me the assistant coach. So even though he was a Red Sox fan, uh, uh, he was a Yankees fan, I was a Red Sox fan, he decided to cross, to cross the bridge and come and invite me to be his assistant coach. He didn't give two bits about me, he wanted Jackson on his team. So we started coaching together. We were together for weeks, months. We started running together. He was a runner, I was a runner. We started meeting and we started running together. It took him several weeks, several months to even figure out that I was a pastor because I usually don't lead with, hi, I'm Reverend Richard Cook. It's good to meet you. Okay, so I was just plain old rich out of the ballpark and you know, he came to me one day, you're a pastor? <laughs> yeah. So we'd run together. This is the international symbol for running. So we're running together one day, we're out at the park, and we had like a friend day coming up at church, and so I said, Mickey, why don't you and Tammy, why don't you guys come to church with me? And he, mid-stride, he smiled and said, no. (laughs) So we kept running. We coached together, we ran together for a year. Same time of the year, the next year came, and I invited Mickey, why don't you and Tammy come to church with us? This time he said yes, they came, The family uh, was transformed by God's love and God's church. I I had the privilege of baptizing Mickey and Tammy and Lindsay and Seth, Mickey's mom, Mickey's grandma, and I got to do the wedding ceremony for uh, Lindsay and her husband, Tyler. And God gave me the privilege of touching that family, not because I'm Pastor Rich, not because I was the world's greatest assistant baseball coach, but just because Mickey was my friend. And I just said, Mickey, come meet a man who's told me everything that I've ever done. Could he be the Messiah? And Jesus does the convincing. When Dane and I were first married, I was a sports writer. I wanted to be on ESPN, but they weren't calling me quite yet. So while I was waiting on ESPN to call and come and start working with Chris Berman, uh, I was a sports writer in a teeny tiny little town. I was a little newspaper writer. And, uh, and I was interviewing a baseball coach one day, and through a series of events, the baseball coach, Jim Baker, Jim said, Rich, why don't you and Dana come to church with us Sunday? And we went. You know why? Because they gave us lasagna afterwards. So Jim and Sherry invited us to church. Jim and Sherry invited us to church. We sat with them. We went to their house after. We ate lasagna with sausage in it. It was awesome. And we went again, and we went again, and we went again. We went for weeks. We went for months. They asked Dana and I to start working with the teens. We worked with the teens for weeks and months. They brought us on staff and put us on staff. And the reason I'm in ministry today, or one of the reasons I'm in ministry today, was because of a phone call when a guy named Jim Baker in the summer of 19. Uh, 1994 said, Rich, why don't you come to church with me? We don't have to convince people of everything that's in this book. We don't have to know everything that's in this book. You don't even have to really be able to explain perfectly your walk with Jesus. Because sometimes that's hard to communicate. We can simply arrange for the introduction. Let me ask you, 
to constantly keep it out before you, to be an inviter. Everybody needs community. Everybody needs relationships. Everybody needs a tribe. Some people's tribes are leading them down a rough path, and they know they need a different tribe. Some people are lonely and broken and are looking for relationship, are looking for example, and what God has given them is you. So like Paul, we can say, follow me as I follow Jesus. Invite people and then tell me about it so we can keep lighting my candle. So go out, shine on people, Tell people about Jesus. Pray for people. Invite people to come to church. And you know what? If you invite people to come to church and they don't come, that's okay. Mickey didn't come either for a while. And then he did. Never underestimate the planting of seeds. You don't know what harvest may come. We're going to go to the table this morning. And we're going to share the Lord's, uh, the Lord's Supper together. And you don't have to be a member of the church. You don't have to be Nazarene. You don't have to know our secret handshake and all that kind of stuff. If you're a believer in Jesus this morning, you're welcome at the table. And as, as we come to the table this morning, let me share this. There's always room at the table for more. There are some cultures, there are some families that when they have big celebratory meals together, they always leave a spot at the table empty for a guest. And so in a sense this morning, there's room at the table for you. And if today you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you can. You can. You can.